Well, hi everyone. Phil here from the Blue Envelope channel. So I thought I'd talk about something maybe a little bit different today. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but in the Kingdom Halls in the United States, almost all of them use the same podium or lectern up on stage. I don't know if it's worldwide or not, um, but at least in, U in the US, almost all halls use this. It's a particular design where the two back legs are slanted out. Here's a uh, pretty pretty terrible quality. Sorry about the <laughs> fuzziness of it, but it's a screenshot from the most recent um, annual meeting last fall. And so you'll notice uh, they were using one of these podiums uh, there. Well, they're all the same because they're all made by one witness that owns his own little woodworking business. And so that witness was my presiding overseer in one of my congregations, and his name is Grant. So I thought maybe I'd make a little video about Grant because he has kind of an interesting story over the years. So uh, to kind of go back towards the beginning, Grant's parents, he was raised as a witness with his brother, and his parents were very active witnesses, like, you know, hardcore, like dad was PO, mom was, um, I didn't know her very well, but she was this sort of matriarch where, um, I mean, she was like old school, like had stood up to mobs in the 40s kind of thing. Um, she was pretty dedicated. So those were his parents. And Grant was born, I would say in the mid 60s. Um, and then he, he had a brother, Steve, that was a few years older than he was. And, you know, it was kind of, I guess, starting in the late 60s where there was this heavy emphasis for uh, witnesses um, to kind of liquidate their assets and go pioneer, go preach somewhere in the few remaining years before Armageddon came in 1975. So, for example, this is from the 93 yearbook talking about that time period. It says, many who cannot serve as missionaries have the missionary spirit. So... In 1968, when the Watchtower began encouraging brothers to move to lands where the need is greater, the Honduras branch office received hundreds of letters from at least 24 countries. So that's kind of what the society was encouraging, and Grant's parents really took that counsel to heart. And so unlike, you know, there were other families like uh, Steve Lett's parents, for example, they, they moved to Special Pioneer in a, a rural congregation a, a couple of states over from where they were. But Grant's mom and dad, they didn't mess around. They took their two little kids and they moved the whole family down to South America to preach. I mean, they were, they were hardcore. I don't remember which country it was that they moved to. But uh, basically, that's where Grant spent the beginning of his life, was growing up in South America. And the cool thing was, as he was just a few years old, um, he basically grew up uh, bilingual. So he just kind of learned Spanish and English simultaneously, uh, essentially became a native Spanish speaker. And yeah, I mean, his Spanish is excellent. No, it's, it's flawless. I was always very jealous of him. So that's where he spent the beginning of his life down there. Um, and, you, you know, eventually the money, they'd kind of budgeted the money to last until 1975. And so that kind of got low and Armageddon didn't come. So um, Grant and his family moved back to uh, New York State. And that's where they spent uh, the rest of their lives. I think it was Grant's dad, if I remember correctly. And sorry, Grant, if you're watching, I'm sure I'm making hundreds of mistakes here. But uh, I believe it was Grant's dad that started the woodworking business. And so you could kind of say in one sense, his, the two boys grew up sort of like uh, Jesus. They were trained by their father to be, to be carpenters, to be woodworkers. And yeah, so that was the family business that they had. Now, as Grant got older, he, of course, started pioneering after high school. And, um, and then it was in 1987 that the society started a new school, which is something that they hadn't done in many, many years. And so they named it the Ministerial Training School, or MTS. Now, in later years, MTS, I would say it was kind of like a cross between KM School for Elders, the Kingdom Ministry School, and maybe mixed with Pioneer School. And that was kind of the, the vibe that you'd get there. 
Um, but in the very first few years of MTS, it was, I would say, essentially like Gilead, except for single men. Um, now it was shorter. It was only two months instead of five months. But those first few years, they were taking the very cream of the crop of young single witness guys in the U.S. And after you graduated, there was a very high probability that you would be sent overseas for an assignment after you graduated. And so just to give you an idea of Grant's spiritual level at that time, he was invited to be in the very first class of MTS in 1987. So it was a pretty big deal when the school started. The first class was held at the Assembly Hall in Coriopolis, Pennsylvania. Um, and three governing body members came down the opening day to kind of inaugurate the school. And so the class lasted about two months. And then at the end of 87, there were 24 students. They graduated and they were assigned to a total of 10 different countries. And so as you can imagine, Grant, of course, being fluent in Spanish, was assigned to a country that could use that. And so he was sent to Honduras. So Honduras was a place of focus for the society in that time period. Um, you know, after 1975 came and went, the witness work slumped in Honduras as it did pretty much everywhere and all the numbers were falling. And as you read it, the, the branch down there was very puzzled and they just couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> Evidently the whole 1975 buildup that had been pushed out from headquarters for 10 years, uh, they didn't really consider that hey, that might be a factor going on. <laughs> and, but so they figured that the congregation publishers must be doing something wrong. And they began this, this project, the scrutiny of the rank and file witnesses to see what they were messing up. <laughs> and so, for example, in the 93 year book, the 93 year book covered the history of Honduras. So that's why I'm referring to it a lot. But on page 187, it says, from 1978 to 1983, a uh, deceleration of theocratic activity in the country concerned elders and faithful publishers alike. After analyzing the situation, the branch committee pinpointed two main causes, materialism and a lack of personal study. Television has had a big impact. Well, thank goodness the branch committee was on the job, right, to find out what the publishers were doing wrong. Now, when you read those two reasons, uh, it might be a little puzzling because Honduras is the fourth poorest country in the entire Western Hemisphere. And when this yearbook came out in 1993, the annual per capita income was only $580 per year <laughs> in Honduras. But clearly, materialism was a big problem down there. That and not enough personal study. Well, once the branch committee got that figured out, then they could start to work on... Uh, counseling all the publishers to quit messing around and get their act together. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, to kind of help out, uh, Watchtower headquarters began to uh, kind of saturate the country with missionaries. So in 1981, 11 missionaries were sent from the newly established Gilead Extension School in Mexico. And then in 1988, three brothers came from ministerial training school assigned to Honduras. And so Grant was one of those three MTS grads that was sent there. And so, yeah, he spent quite a number of years down there uh, in the country. And, you know, during that period, the investment that the society made in sending a lot of manpower down there, uh, it really paid off. And so as you see the numbers, they definitely took a, a sharp spike upwards in publishers and pioneers and whatnot uh, into the 80s and 90s there. And eventually they got so many new faces that the country began to kind of outgrow its Bethel facility. Um, the branch down there, the building dated from around the 60s. Uh, Grant and the two other MTS grads got there in 88 and construction on a new branch edition had already begun by that point. And eventually they doubled the size of the branch office, which was completed in 1989. And so that year, Lyman Swingle from the governing body came down to dedicate the new edition. It's kind of interesting now to read his take at that time on the future of the work in Honduras. So in the 93 year book again, it says, Ask what he, Lyman Swingle, what he thought of the theocratic prospects for Honduras. His vision went well beyond the immediate future. He replied, 
the prospects for Honduras and every other country are very good because Jehovah's organization will soon be making the entire earth into a paradise. So those were his thoughts in 89. Uh, Lyman Swingle eventually died in 2001 at age 90. And uh, Jehovah's organization hadn't quite turned the earth into a paradise just yet, so he didn't get to see that. Um, I'm sure it'll be any day now. In 2011, the Honduras branch office that he dedicated was closed down by the society. It's kind of funny when you read in the 2013 yearbook, there's this uh, big article that announced the beginning of construction for the new Warwick branch complex. And yet, as you read further into that article, <laughs> it also mentions, oh yeah, by the way, we're closing the Honduras branch and five other Central American branches, and their work was taken over, it was absorbed into the Mexico branch office. So 40 Bethelites from those branches were moved to Mexico, and then 95 other Bethelites were uh, fired that year. It's just, I don't know, it's just a little funny to think about them all getting their pink slips down in Central America as it simultaneously announced that the Bethelites in America are getting their third Bethel complex. So I'm sure they kind of had mixed feelings a little bit about that announcement. And in the year since then, uh, you know, the growth in Honduras, like many countries, has just kind of been stagnant. Uh, as you look at the figures for 2019, the, the average publishers last year are a couple hundred less than they were in 2016. I don't know, maybe it's that darn materialism creeping up again on them. The uh, annual per capita income now is up to a, a massive $1,600 per year. So obviously raking in the dough down there. And so, yeah, Grant spent quite a few years down there. But eventually, as his parents got older, he moved back to the United States to help out. And he and his brother, Steve, kind of took over the woodworking business. Uh, their dad died eventually. And actually, Steve, his brother, died young from cancer. And so basically, Grant runs the business himself nowadays, which I guess maybe it's a good thing. He's, he's more or less the only one considering how few kingdom halls are being built. This, these days. Uh, I'm sure his orders have dropped off a little bit in recent years. Where we lived, in, which was in western New York, there's there's a decent number of Amish communities in the area and a lot of sawmills that Amish uh, guys work at. So it's actually a pretty good place to have a woodworking business just because there's such a supply of, of wood in the area. Well, I thought we could take just a little look at the uh, website for the Grant's Wood Shop here that provides the podiums. So this is the main page, and we can flip over to uh, features here. You can see it kind of shows the main features of the stand. Now, if you really want it to be deluxe, you can get a motor in the podium that will move the top part up and down electronically. So those were pretty hoity-toity. Um, of course, our Kingdom Hall had one of those because that's the hall Grant <laughs> went to, so we had the best. But they're very un that's the only hall I've ever been to that actually went for the electric one. So he actually makes quite a few different things, but by far the main thing you see is this um, speaker stand. And yeah, so you can kind of see the prices there. Runs runs about six hundred bucks or so for one of these. But he actually makes quite a few different styles, which again you don't really see the optional styles like this. They're pretty uncommon. He's actually getting into a few different styles here, especially for um, ASL congregations. So ones where you can really move the front part low so that you can see somebody's hands. 
this is one of the brothers from the one of the local congregations there posing. Let's see, what else do we have? He even makes little miniature ones for uh, kids. I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen one of those in a kingdom hall before. So those are the stands, and then he also makes like matching tables for the, where the sisters could give talks. So this is when you see a fair amount with the slanted sides so that the um, the two women can kind of face each other and, and face the audience at the same time. And then he makes just kind of more general tables, even conference tables here. Those must be a bear to ship. And does a little bit with chairs too for the for the sisters' talks, I guess. Then he has a little page with the different, you know, stain options you can get. And I think these are all locally sourced woods. Uh, like like I said, there's a lot of sawmills and Amish workers in the area. And so there's a lot of uh, wood supply there. And yeah, I guess that's about it. Checking out the uh, order site there. So just a little interesting look. So it may sound a little funny, but Grant has always been able to keep using his Spanish even in the middle of Amish country in rural New York state. Um, you know, Jamestown has had a Spanish group there for many, many years, and it kind of goes up and down. It waxes and wanes over the years, but uh, it kind of picked up again in the mid 2000s. That's kind of that period when the society was really pushing, um, starting to push learning a foreign language and joining a, a group like that. And uh, so in Jamestown, I mean, Grant was just like a natural uh, thought to that he should be the instructor for a Spanish class. And so we, we started a class there in 2005. And uh, yeah, so Grant was our teacher. He's very good. He has a great sense of humor. He's a, he's a pretty funny guy. He kind of got the nickname El Cabezón in the class, which is, uh, I guess it's sort of a little play on words. It sort of means like head, like big head. So in the sense that he was the boss, the, the, the guy running the class, and then also it was like a little play on words that he, he was, his head was getting inflated, his ego. Um, but it was all in good fun. He, he got a kick out of being El Cabezón. I, honestly, thinking back, I was never really that good of friends with Grant. And um, I think it was because he was a pretty fun-loving guy. And honestly, when I was a witness, I was kind of a stick in the mud. I was pretty boring, by the book sort of guy who I was always afraid of doing anything wrong and getting in trouble. And so I never did anything interesting. And so we never really clicked because we were um, on two different wavelengths in that respect. But definitely had a good time in the class. Grant was a good teacher. Uh, I remember we finished by doing a little Bible drama in, in costume for our friends and family that came on graduation day. And basically, there were enough of us locally right in the Jamestown area there that the Spanish group was able to kind of push over the hump and turn into a congregation. And so we were in the Spanish congregation there, and that was cool. Um, you know, they're a fun group and lots of little get-togethers and parties and dancing and good Spanish food. Um, again, I never quite clicked with that. I always felt like the dorky white guy. Um, I don't know, my hips just don't seem to move right for Spanish dancing. Uh, Grant, of course, he, he was a great dancer, so that was uh, right up his alley. 
Uh, let's see. So maybe a year or so after the Spanish class finished, Grant took a few of us down for a vacation to his old stomping grounds in Honduras. So he would kind of go down there pretty much every year or two for a vacation. Um, and so, yeah, that was a pretty cool trip. That was my first time ever outside North America. And we had our own built-in bilingual guide, which was awesome. And so he just kind of took us around to the major cities, Tegucigalpa, um, San Pedro Sula. Yeah, we had good food. I remember they had good steak down there, like a lot of, you know, Central South American countries do. Um, we visited friends that Grant had had for many years down there. Um, I remember one family we visited, and it was kind of interesting because in Honduras, they were considered to be quite well off. Um, but that meant well off for Honduras. So they had a, ni a nice house, you know, like a in the U.S., just kind of a normal lower middle class kind of house. Um, but to afford that, the parents and all the adult children had to all live together in the one house and work full time to be able to afford that standard of living. So, yeah, I mean, the, the economy is perhaps better than it was in Honduras, but still much, much lower than it, it ever, you know, compared to the U.S. here. Let's see, we tried zip lining down there one day. That was pretty cool. I've never done that before. Um, we went to some natural hot springs one day. And then for, I remember for kind of big jumps from city to city, we would ride a bus. We'd take these long bus trips. And the bus, I don't think it had a bathroom. And so we would stop every so often for bathroom breaks. And, you know, you'd have 10 minutes or whatever to get out and do whatever. And then the bus would take off again. Um, I remember at one stop, uh, I guess my sister, Susanna, she thought that it, the bus wouldn't leave until everybody was back on. And I, I think I kind of thought that too. Um, and so she was sort of dilly-dallying after the 10 minutes or whatever were up. And the bus just pulled out and started to, to drive away without her. And we, we jumped up and said, oh, stop, stop. You know, she's not here. So we had to run out and, and wrangle her back on the bus. So that was a fun trip, for sure. Um, you know, eventually, I, after a few years, I moved to a different Spanish congregation, and many of the, most of the students that I had been in the class with um, did the same. Either they went back to English congregation or moved somewhere else to a different Spanish congregation. So I, to be honest, I don't even know if the Spanish congregation nowadays is still going in, in Jamestown or if it's kind of been demoted back down to a group again. But if it is a congregation, I'm sure Grant is still the, the coordinator of Body of Elders, uh, as he was for all the time I was there. Let's see, what else? Um, yeah, so I mean, all, you know, in all his years, Grant has never gotten married. Um, he has some dogs, so a couple of dogs, which was nice. Um, but yeah, otherwise, just uh, kind of lived by himself. He had a house not far from his wood, woodworking shop. Um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, if you've ever seen Lloyd Evans, that awesome interview he has with Howie Rutledge Tran, who, Howie was another, you know, good guy, just a normal, well-adjusted guy, but never married, um, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So, let's see, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's about it, really. Um, Nothing, nothing too salacious to share. I just thought it'd be kind of interesting because Grant was a cool guy, and to kind of talk about where the uh, where the podiums come from and all the kingdom halls. All right. Well, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, leave a comment if you like, um, and uh, we'll catch you in the next video. Have a good one.